Welcome to the Effortless Swimming Podcast. My guest today is Craig Cooper, and Craig is the author of a book called Your New Prime, which Tony Robbins has called The Blueprint for Men Over 40. Craig is also a serial entrepreneur, he's a venture capitalist and host of the American TV show, Adventure Capitalist. He's originally a New Zealander, but grew up in Australia and now lives in Newport Beach in California. And on today's episode, we talk about how you may shift your training and your diet and a number of other things as you get older, from when you go to your 20s, to your 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on, and some of the shifts and some of the beliefs that Craig has had to change in order to keep himself injury-free and keep himself healthy and fit. We also talk about how you can cultivate your friendships and your tribe, particularly through sport, as this is a really important part of keeping yourself mentally healthy. And this is something that I've seen uh, with, our, with our camps and through masters swimming, that having this, this tribe, this group of friends that you can develop through swimming is a really important part of life. We also talk about why it doesn't matter how much money you've got, how much fame, how much celebrity you've got, everyone is going through the same issues. And Craig knows this from meeting very famous people and knowing very famous people through the work that he does. And he says that there's no difference between between people, no matter how much fame uh, or how much money they've got. Another thing we talk about is the swim run community and why this is a, an event that Craig has really been drawn to and, uh, and really enjoys. Another thing we talk about is how you can get out of being complacent in your life. Now, there's an element of some things we want to have certainty around, having some structure and some schedule. But we also need to have some level of uncertainty of things that we don't know what's going to happen, a level of adventure and play and having that uncertainty in our lives. And we talk about how you can have a bit more of that if you feel like it's something that might be missing in your life. Let's get into the episode. Here's Craig Cooper. Craig, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Uh, we recorded this last week and as soon as I got off the call, I realized for some reason it didn't record your the sound on on your end. And first of all, I was frustrated and I was embarrassed that I cannot believe that, uh, that I sort of wasted your time with it, but I appreciate you getting back on and, uh, and offering to do this again. So mate, thank you very much for, uh, for doing it. Uh, no, and someone who can admit their mistakes, uh, Brenton is, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, highly credible in my books. <laughs> well, I, I was, I was thinking of it like in my mind, every excuse in the book was coming up like, all right, how do I, how do I make it seem like it, it wasn't my fault? But in the end, look, it comes down to me and uh, just rip off that band aid, and it will all be fine. But uh, yeah, at the time I, I wasn't get, too happy. I get double the amount of time with you. So, you know, it's a bonus. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> well, Craig, uh, your, um, your background is primarily in, in, in business, um, but you've also um, written a book called Your New Prime, which, um, which is, most uh, mainly for uh, adults or men over 40 um, and how they can continue to, to be healthy, keep strong and, uh, and live a good life. So how did that come about where your background's primarily business, but then moving into uh, writing a book about men's health? Yeah, well, uh, you know, business has been my business, like it has to be right. But my uh, passion has always been uh, uh, my health and, you know, uh, I say that because it's kind of been a selfish endeavor for quite some time, ever since I was, you know, going back to when I was nine, when I had encephalitis, I was in a coma for a month. When I was 11, I nearly lost my left leg um, through to a thing called osteomyelitis. I had viral pericarditis through sort of my 17th through to my 19th year. So I've had this history of inflammation and it's been, uh, you know, obviously a big deal for me. You know, I was... Um, you know, I was a subject of a, you know, a, you know, a single mother sort of upbringing. So I was sort of out on the street a lot, you know, in New Zealand and then subsequently in Australia. So, you know, I had to take care of myself and that was, you know, basically, you know, bringing myself up, you know, just as a person, but also sort of looking after my health, um, you know, as a, you know, teenager and into my sort of early adult life. So, you know, it's been a, it's been a big focus of mine for sort of like 25, 30 years and it's been you know, really the book was a sort of passion project around, you know, how do I keep myself healthier? Because, you know, as I've sort of grown older and sort of, you know, the medical literature has evolved, we've found out that, you know, inflammation is just more and more at the core of, you know, disease. And, you know, it's not just, you know, the, you know, stroke and heart attack and, um, you know, general lifestyle disorders, but, you know, full metabolic disorders that, you know, we're subject to as we age are sort of rooted more and more in inflammation. And I've kind of got the, the inflammation gene, which I've had since, you know, I was born. So, you know, it was a passion project for me in order to keep me thriving through my, 
you know, 40s and 50s, and I'm sort of turning 57 um, next Saturday. But it was also, you know, as I researched it more, um, it became more of a mission to sort of how do I get um, sort of more and better information out there to men uh, my age and um, and educate them better because, you know, the, on the one hand, there's, you know, so little information available to men, especially around um, my age. You know, there's a big focus on, you know, abs and biceps for, you know, guys in their, you know, teenagers, and that's the focus of most of the media. But in terms of, you know, 40 plus, in terms of the things that kind of really matter to you as your age, there's sort of very little information out there about that. And at the same time, there's a lot of disinformation, right? We get sound bites from the, you know, the six o'clock news every night where, you know, we're just uh, inundated with sort of, you know, the influencer marketing around uh, fitness and health. And a lot of it is, you know, not rooted in science. I mean, basically anyone can come in and become an influencer, you know, if you've got, you know, you know, a good body and, you know, you know, 500,000 followers on Instagram, whatever it might be, right? So there's a lot of disinformation there. So I wanted to cut through all that, particularly as it sort of relates to sort of guys my age and provide a platform for them to sort of thrive forward. And, you know, not just about fitness, because that's only, you know, one part of, um, you know, being healthy. I wanted to focus on, you know, every aspect that, um, that uh, you know, drives you forward and helps you thrive forward mentally, physically, emotionally, sectionally, and nutritionally. And fitness is only a small part of that uh, because fitness changes as you age. You know, fitness is not just about, as I said, you know, biceps and abs, and that's really the focus of the media. Fitness at you know, my age, and I think you're 32 now, Brenton, is that right? Yeah. So you know, uh, you know, my fitness regime is a lot different to, you, to yours, even though I – you know, through your videos and everything, I, you know, try and keep up with you as much as I can. But, you know, for me, it's more about, you know, flexibility, mobility, um, uh, you know, strength is a huge part of it. Um, you know, obviously, as we start to lose muscle mass as we age, but it's, you know, it's a different um, platform once you hit your sort of 40s and above. Are there some beliefs that you had 10, 20 years ago that have, that have changed? What are the, the main beliefs that you've you've changed in that time where you, you realize that maybe what you um, thought you could do when you were 20 or 30, that maybe isn't the smartest option now, uh, or some of those things where you were, you've completely switched stances. I mean, I know with my, with my coaching, uh, with my swimming, there's been a few things where I've, I've had my eyes open to what I originally thought when I started. Is there any, uh, anything that stands out to you there? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you've got to, I mean, you've got to realize your limitations as your age, right? Because, you know, I kept pushing as hard as I could, you know, as long as I could. And, you know, I got to the point where I was just rolling between injuries, right? So, you know, my, my whole sort of training and, um, you know, athletic, you know, uh, you know, platform and, um, you know, the comp competitions that I was entering, they were basically structured around whether I was healthy or whether I was injured. And as you get older and older, um, you just got to realize that, you know, you've just got to step it back a bit. I mean, I, I, competed, I competed in competitive Spartan racing up until about three years ago. Uh, and I was, you know, to that point, just really just racing between injuries because, you know, it was a, you know, it was a, a heavy, both endurance, uh, you know, high intensity, sort of strength-based exercise program with a lot of exercises, which not necessarily sort of uh, conducive to health as you age, you know, a lot of squats, a lot of heavy, heavy lifting and twists. I mean, I was continuously just putting myself out of the game just through sort of the exercise regime that I was undertaking. So at some point, you've just got to say like some things you've just got to like stop and realize that that's, um, that's not conducive to a sort of a long-term sustainable health program. Um, so for me, that was... Um, you know, when you look at specifics, there was a lot of like squat work. Um, there's a lot of evidence around, um, you know, squats as you age in terms of barbell squats, in terms of, you know, um, in terms of the impact on that as you age. You know, I do a lot of kettlebell squats just in terms of goblet squats and I've sort of, um, sort of mixed that up a little bit. But you can still continue to get the same sort of strength benefit, but um, sort of, you know, using different machines and the like. So, you know, I've changed that whole strength regime um, nutritionally, you know, we all, you know, used to eat whatever we want, right? We, you know, we're bulletproof, you know, so, 
you know, now I eat a you know, very high proportion of fats because, you know, from the point of view of brain health and, and sexual health and maintaining your testosterone, fats are a huge component of that. Um, I eat a small amount of carbs, but I have to balance that in terms of the endurance work that I'm doing around, um, you know, specifically the triathlon training that I'm doing at the moment. Um, and I eat a higher proportion of protein um, uh, now than I did in the past because, you know, once you hit like 30 is the age, but really once you hit about 40, 45, your body really starts to um, break down your muscle mass. So you need to eat a high proportion of protein uh, per kilogram or pound of body weight um, and then supplement that obviously with, you know, higher sort of, you know, load strength work. So um, less less um, in terms of um, volume, in terms of strength work, but more in terms of intensity. Higher, um, heavier weights as you age, pretty much as heavy as you can lift um, as you age in terms of maintaining muscle mass, but, um, but less volume in terms of a weekly basis. So, you know, you don't do weights every day. So I break my sort of training range scheme up into sort of endurance, uh, tempo, um, high intensity training and strength, strength work. And I kind of mix um, that up on a, week, um, on a weekly basis. Um, and that's kind of where I focus. Mm. And with, uh, with the other side of things as well, in terms of your, we spoke about this last time, your, your tribe, the, your friends, family, that sort of thing, has that shifted in focus as in you've, have you felt like that's become a, a more important part of your life or you've, you've come to understand it as that? And, and the reason I ask that is for me, I think particularly in my twenties, uh, I probably didn't have much of a focus on it. You know, it just sort of naturally happens. You might be at university and that sort of thing happens a lot easier but as soon as you have kids uh sometimes that can fall by the wayside because you become so busy with that so what i've tried to do with with that is uh put a little bit more time and effort into cultivating that and and being able to keep in touch or spend time with with friends and and keep that going because uh it i've seen it be a really important part of uh, mental health and also just the the side of things where you're, you're having fun you're able to play you're able to um uh really just take a take a step back from uh, all of the other stuff that you do yeah i mean uh i mean you're lucky in that you know when you're young <laughs> and so you know when you're you know younger it's easier to cultivate friendships you know you've still got the sort of hangover from you know college and your sort of you know early sort of stage friendships um, and also you're in a social environment just in terms of your business you know you're continuously networking you know whether it's your social networks and everything so you're lucky to have that part of your as part of your platform, but that's not the case for, you know, upwards of 60% of men, if I can just speak about men in the United States in particular. Um, the latest figures show that, you know, upwards of 60% don't have a single person that they can actually um, talk to, uh, which is, a, you know, a massive, you know, social health problem, as well as, as you pointed out, you know, a significant mental health um, uh, you know, problem, you know, globally. And that is basically um, being accelerated by the fact that not only are uh, we lonely as a uh, population, but when you layer on top of that, so sort of the level of social isolation that we're in at the moment, it basically doubles the health and uh, uh, both physical health and mental health uh, impact of that. And I say physical health because, you know, loneliness has been, you know, correlated equal to, um, uh, the uh, impact of uh, smoking and obesity in terms of um, the ultimate health effects. So, you know, it's a it's a significant public health disorder. So, you know, the challenge uh, to your point as you get older is cultivating those friendships and you know um, putting in place you know in effect you know systems in order to you know, make that happen because, you know, as you get older, it just doesn't come as natural as it does when you're younger because, you know, your fall, friends fall by the wayside, you know, everyone's, you know, locked into their, um, you know, own little world with their kids and their sort of immediate network around school and the like. So, you know, it's important to both, you know, cultivate those friendships um, as well as cull them as you move forward as well because, um, you know, you obviously want to maintain, you know, healthy friendships around, uh, yourself in terms of people who promote you and people who, you know, advance you because, you know, the old saying is, you know, the average of the five people that you, you know, mix with. And it's, you know, it's absolutely true. So you don't want to make sure you, you have to make sure that those people who you are, 
you know, cultivating in your inner network are those that you can both contribute to as a person um, and, that, uh, and that also you can pull from. Um, so, you know, that's why groups like YPO and, you know, religious groups um, are, you know, important in a lot of cultures because uh, they bring together uh, the community, they bring together those true sort of social networks. And it's those countries, if you look at, you know, Sardinia and um, Okinawa and uh, Loma Linda, California with the Seventh-day Adventists, it's those groups which show the, you know, the longest lifespans. If you look at the Blue Zones, for example, you know, they're grounded in community. It's not so much about the diet or, you know, there's no, you know, Equinox, you know, health centers in, you know, Sardinia, you know, with, you know, 50 people, you know, deep on a treadmill every day, right? Those people live long and, uh, you know, healthy lives because, you know, it's all about moderation. It's about social connections. It's about, you know, eating less and, you know, higher plant-based diets. It's about, uh, you know, walking to the shops every day. Um, you know, there are, there are, there are you know, fundamental um, uh, similarities amongst those countries in the blue zones that actually, you know, lead to those, um, you know, positive health effects. Mm. It's something that I, I noticed, particularly on our, our camps, our, like our Hell Week camps in Thailand, got 20 odd swimmers there, a couple of coaches and every, pretty much every meal you're there with at least a bunch of other swimmers from the group. We're having breakfast, lunch, dinner, you're training, you're staying in the same resort. Like it's in seven days or eight days, you feel like you've gotten to know these people so well and you really feel that sense of community and, and that sense of like, it's just, for me, it's, you know, I, I go there and it, it feels very much like a holiday, even though, you know, we're coaching, we're getting up early and that sort of thing. But it's just a, it is a really enjoyable time because you do not get that sort of social interaction um, and, and make those, those sort of friends just in, day to day life in that short space of time. And, and when you're in a, an environment like that, uh, you know, we've got people who have uh, met at a camp, say five years ago, and they're still friends today. They catch up if they are ever in each other's city and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And it's, um, and that's what I really love to, to see. And I think back to when I was at uh, college at a university, like you, it was pretty great to live with. You got 200 or well, about 150, 200 other people there in this, this environment. You get to know a couple of them really well. And that's that place where you can just, you're basically living with your friends. It is really enjoyable. Like it's uh, those, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't come naturally. I mean, uh, you know, you've got to actively cultivate it. You know, joining a swim squad, which I did, you know, a couple of years ago when I got back into, you know, sort of adult swimming, right, was a, you know, uh, you know uh, was a, you know, step towards that in that environment. You know, joining clubs, um, you know, actively, you know, promoting social engagements with, you know, both your sort of like core inner network as well as, you know, the sort of outer um, outer rings of that network as well. And, you know, some people just sit back and go, Yo, you know, why hasn't Jack called me? I haven't heard from him forever. Well, pick up the phone yourself and call him, right? Um, you know, actively, you know, promote something. I am, you know, I'm known amongst sort of my network as kind of like the glue that sort of brings everyone together because I'm the guy who's actively on, you know, on text during the week, you know, where are we going to ride? Let's go do the swim. Let's hit down the beach tomorrow. You know, I put out, you know, 500% more than I get back um, from that group. But, you know, the bits that I get back, um, you know, are super important to me. But, you know, I would never stop doing that just because I don't think I'm getting, you know, the same back. I get a lot back from my, you know, from my networks. And I have a bunch of different networks. You know, I have business, I have training, I have, um, you know, that's, probably it sport business, <laughs> but, um, um, you know, I have, you know, sort of, uh, compartmentalized networks. Um, and, uh, but I'm actively promoting them and sort of driving them like, you know, consistently, because if you just sit there, like it's the whole thrust of my book really is about getting out of complacency, right? It's about striving forward in your, you know, middle age, getting out of complacency in terms of your, you know, uh, your friendships, Right, because um, you know you carry over a lot of friendships from a lot of years, and you know you don't really realize you don't really do a sort of a friend audit, you know, as you go through life, because you know people just stick with you. Um, you know, it's like the same old guys you play golf with in the weekend or catch up with it, and you don't realize, um, you know, what necessarily whether that's you know a healthy platform to continue to carry forward, right? Because you're complacent in it. Just like, 
your nutrition, just like your health network in terms of your doctors and everyone who sort of feeds into that network. You know, you've had the same doctor for 15 years. Maybe it's time to do a health audit with, uh, with, um, with that team. So it's about basically doing an audit on your life at, at, you know, and I draw 40 at the line, but, you know, it certainly is not to sort of the benchmark for when you start. I mean, I laugh because I get, um, you know, guys, when I talk to them about my book, they go, oh, that all sounds fantastic. I'll buy your book when I'm 40. I'm 39 now, right? I say, dude, it's like, <laughs> there's no time to wait. Um, but um, it's really about how you get out of complacency from a relationship perspective is extremely important, right? Because, you know, you look at the divorce rate, particularly around where I live in Orange County, it's, you know, it's pretty much 80% of people in my street have been divorced. Now, Orange County is a very, I think it's the highest divorce rate in California down here, right? Um, so when you look at midlife crisis, both from the point of view of your health audit, from the point of view of your friends, from the point of view of, of your relationship, you know, it's a very important benchmark because you don't have that long to go, right? Um, so you want to make sure that you've got, you know, optimal health. You want to make sure that you're in a relationship that you're thriving with, um, that, uh, that your friend's group is feeding you and not, you know, um, and not taking from you. Um, so, you know, in terms of putting in place, you know, the core components of that going forward in order that you can thrive going forward in your 50s, you know, 60s and beyond, that's really sort of where my focus has been. And I like even just bringing up the conversation of having that audit and just seeing where you're at with different, different parts of your life having that come to mind is a, is a good way to, to start that and, and start to make some changes. And I know, you know, Tony Robbins, and one of the things he talks about is certainty and uncertainty. And we spoke a little bit about this last time. Like it's, we, it's great to, you want to have habits, you want to have rituals in place. That's what's going to help you grow and develop in certain areas. But we also want that element of uncertainty where a bit, bit, bit of adventure, a bit of play and, and getting out yeah. of that complacency. And, you know, for, for me, a uh, number of ways I like to do it, there's, there's surfing where there's always that element of uncertainty, especially on the bigger days, mountain biking and just not having a destination in mind and just exploring. Um, same thing with running as well. I really like that um, where you, you don't really have a, a place in mind. You're just running around and uh, seeing where it takes you. Um, uh, yeah. as, as well as well as open water swimming, there's certainly that that element of of uncertainty. And for me, if I can have that a couple times a week in my you know, in my schedule, then um, that's what you know. Then I find when I am in those, those structured environments or that that schedule uh, where I know I've got things on, then I can do that happily. But without that element of, of uncertainty, I find it very hard to sit down and actually do the work or do the thing that I do have set in the diary. Yo, my, uh it's funny you raise it because my favorite runs are in the canyon up you know, behind my home where we actually set out. We don't actually have a destination or a loop. We just say, oh, wherever we end up, we'll just get an Uber back, right? <laughs> uh, you know, at the times when you could get an Uber, can't get one now. But, um, I mean, those are, the, those are the best times, right? You know, whether it's hiking and, you know, the, you know, the national parks here, whatever it is. I mean, um, you know, what we've learned, I think, more and more, you know, um, you know the last couple of months is that there is no certainty, right? And I've been through, you know, a number of black swans in my life, you know, financial crisis and stock market booms and, you know, and the like, probably four or five. And this is obviously, you know, ranks up there at the, at the top. But, you know, in terms of, um, you know, certainty in life, I mean, there is no certainty, right? So, you know, we, you know, you, you can't live your life as if there is certainty, you know, as to, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen the next day, you know, because there are these massive black swans that they come inevitably um, out of the blue. We never know what they're going to look like. So, you know, it's tried to say and it's cliched, but, you know, in terms of, you know, living in the moment, you know, that's, you know, it's, a, it's just a, a you know, a, a, a key takeaway, I think, for, for you know, the glo global population in terms of, you know, what we're suffering, you know, through at the moment, because, you know, we realize there may not be a tomorrow, right? Our tomorrow is massively, you know, impacted by an event such as, you know, what we're going through at the moment. So I find that, you know, there's a lot of good coming out of the situation at, you know, at the moment, because, you know, one of the big takeaways is that, you know, we're all sort of like, you know, realizing that, you know, firstly, there is no tomorrow. Secondly, it's, you know, we can live very, you know, much simpler than what we were living before. Um, you know, thirdly, our friendships are key. And I think we can identify that core group that we talked about before more and more through this 
process because they're the ones that are reaching out to you on Zoom and saying, hey, you want to catch up? I just want to see how you are, um, which, you know, I've had, you know, maybe, you know, four or five friends who I haven't talked to for quite some time, you know, reach out to me and do, which has been, you know, fantastic. I had a friend in Melbourne, very close friend, who reached out two weeks ago and just said, hey, I just want to reach out and just make sure we're all okay. You know, for that to happen amongst men's groups um, is very, very rare because, you know, we're, we're a, you know, we're a, you know, lone wolf culture and the older you get, um, the more isolated you become. And if you're sort of operating at a certain level in, you know, business, it's very, very hard to curate close friendships because, you know, by the nature of what you're doing, you know, you're, uh, you're nervous about your position. You're nervous about exposing yourself emotionally, um, to other people in terms of, you know, discussing, you know, your problems and things that are going on in your life. So the older you get, the more successful you get, the more isolated you actually become. And then if you take Silicon Valley, for an example, about they're saying in the latest studies, about 30% of Silicon Valley startup executives are chronically depressed. And there's about 15 to 18% of them, which are, you know, suicidal. And we're seeing a massive suicide epidemic among startup founders um, in Silicon Valley for that very reason, because, you know, not only do they have a massive amount of pressure on them, uh, given the sort of nature environment that they're working in up there, but, um, uh, to succeed, uh, but they also have no one to talk to. So, you know, it's incredibly important that we start to foster these groups and in the United States, we've never had it. Um, if you look at the institutionalized, uh, health system here, uh, We've had an office of women's health for about nearly 30 years um, uh, in the White House. Uh, uh, there's been a lobby group for about 20 years to get an office of men's health, and it gets nowhere every year. Every year, the White House, well, before Trump, every year the White House was lit up in blue, uh, sorry, in pink for, um, you know, uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Week. Um, it took nearly 25 years to get it lit up in blue just for, you know, Men's Health Week for prostate cancer. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no, there's no focus institutionally on men's health here in the United States, which is a big issue, which means no money goes into it. Conversations about women's health consistently, which is a great thing, but you know, more men die of prostate cancer every year than breast cancer. Um, and there's, you know, very little discussion or, you know, to talk about the issues that men have to go through. Mm. And for me, one of my closest friendships has come from when, uh, well, for, for me, uh, this friend, we've had two mutual friends pass away. So one just, um, just, it just happened and, and one was from suicide. And those two things brought us really close together. Uh, whereas before that, yes, we were great friends, but it was a, it was a different level of, of friendship. And so now having gone through those, having those two friends pass away um, and, and being mutual friends, it's a very different relationship, but one where we're much more open. We're willing to share how we're feeling. Um, yeah. and, the, and the actual things that we're going through and it's that sort of relationship that um, yeah, I, I probably hadn't really had that before because I hadn't been through something like that. And, uh, and it's, it's a completely different thing. But um, when you're comfortable sharing exactly what's going on, it, it oh, makes a sure. massive difference. Yeah, I feel like you mentioned Tony Robbins. I've known Tony for, uh, I don't know, well, in my third, early 30s, I went to you know, my first Unleash the Power Within when I moved to the United States, him and I became good friends and um, did a bunch of business together, traveled a whole bunch and, you know, I spent a whole bunch of time with him on his plane and, and you know, you realize even at sort of that level, um, you know, everyone's got a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's got a story. Everyone needs help in some sense. So, you know, the, I, the, I think there's a movement in Australia and New Zealand about sort of reaching out and, you know, just asking, I've forgotten what it was called, but I've seen some references to it about, um, you know, just basically reaching out if you, um, you know, if you need help um, because, you know, everyone thinks everyone else is all right, right? Um, everyone's got a problem. Tony's got problems. Um, everyone's got problems, right? You know, you think everyone's got the perfect life financially, you know, emotionally with their partners and the kids. It's just all BS, right? You really, once you get, they say never meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed. Mm -hmm. You know, once you get behind the screen, no matter who it is, um, you know, I, you know, talk about in my book where, um, you know, I spent um, you know, a lot of summers, uh, you know, up until probably last year, I'd travel up to Malibu every weekend 
um, because I'd go up to Laird Hamilton's house up there um, because, you know, he's got a you know 25 meter pool, which is about 20 feet deep. And it's about probably, you know, 30 feet wide. It's a massive big pool in his backyard. And um, throughout the week and particularly on Saturdays, there'd be about maybe 15 to 20 guys and girls, you know, came together at Laird's house. Um, and this was, you know, you know, uh, you know, movie directors, famous, you know, NBA players, everyone from, you know, John McEnroe to, um, you know, to Barbara Streisand and, you know, all these people would turn up, right? Just like you'd be sitting in, you know, the pool and suddenly, you know, Orlando Bloom would come in, right? It was awesome. It was just like a repository of all these people that would be pulled and it didn't matter what you did, what you had done, because half the people there, you don't know who they are until you find out who they are. But the rest, obviously, you know who you are. But everyone who came there um, were only invited and only got to stay and had longevity in that training environment if they had something to contribute to the group, right? Because it wasn't just a matter of just turning up, hanging out, doing some pool training, because you know, that was the foundation of what became XPT training. You've probably seen that more, more now, uh, which is the underwater training system which led and um, his wife Gabby started with uh, Brian McKenzie and Darren O'Leon. Um, that was the sort of foundations of that training. But to my point, everyone who came there had something to contribute. So, you know, if you came and you sucked from the group and you're a celebrity horde, then you wouldn't get fight back, right? But if you came and actually contributed into the process, it's not about just being, uh, you know, physically uh, fit and involving yourself in. But there was a, um, there was a you know, huge sort of Swedish sauna that sort of led as next to his pool. So, you know, we'd do swim training, then we'd do, you know, ice rotations in the ice bucket. We'd go into the sauna. Any one time there'd be, you know, maybe 10 or 12 people in the sauna. And, you know, once you got in the sauna, it was like one of those, you know, uh, Indian tribe sort of like truth barrels, right? You know, everyone's there in their bodies or, you know, in their speedos. And, you know, all guards come down, right? So, you know, you got to the point where you're talking with, you know, significant, you know, celebrities and public figures about their, you know, their, you know, divorces and, you know, problems they're having with, you know, this and that and, you know, the children. And, and it became, to me, it was the first sort of like therapeutic sort of, you know, men and women's group that, you know, I had been involved in. And, you know, I say in my book, it was the reason why I drove, you know, nearly two hours on a Saturday morning, you know, from Newport Beach, California up to, up to sort of Malibu, you know, every weekend because, you know, from the point of view of my personal therapy and what I was getting sort of out of that group and the friendships that, you know, I, you know, grew and cultivated out of it, uh, you know, they were priceless. So it takes effort, right? It takes effort to maintain friendships. And the hardest thing to do, just given the nature of our lives and, you know, how busy we think we all are, is to just pick up the phone or, you know, have a real communication with someone outside of just texting or, you know, commenting on their Instagram page or whatever it is. And I think, you know, when you look at, you know, this sort of interaction and how that's becoming more and more pervasive and it's going to be, you know, more and more, um, you know, I think that's one of the key key sort of benefits we're seeing out of this crisis at the moment. Mm. And and going forwards, uh, you know, for you, what's, what are you most looking forwards to in the next 6, 12, 24 months? And um, what are some of the, the challenges that you're looking forward to, to taking on, whether it be business, personal, triathlon? What have you got coming up? Um, so let me think. Well, I'd love to get back on a plane and go to the Maldives next week. That would be, that would be ideal. <laughs> Even just go down to Mexico for the weekend. I mean, just those small things that you miss, right? Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, I really am getting cabin fever at the moment. <laughs> um, so I'm missing that. Luckily, unlike you, it's four degrees in Melbourne. Uh, we're coming into summer here, so uh, you know California is getting um, you know getting the weather back again. Um, but athletically, look, I'm really op- looking forward to everything opening up again. I'm sort of you know just holding my breath every week to see you know what those schedules are looking um, like. You know, I'm participating in the swim run um, uh, sort of world, which I love. I did Breca last year, and I did the Australian Champs, and I just did the Otillo. Um, World Champ Series in Catalina, which kind of slipped under the radar before um, before COVID. So I love the swim run movement to our point because it's very, very conducive to community. Mm-hmm. Unlike triathlon, which I've sort of like dived back into, um, swim run, it's an older demographic. 
much more sort of collegiate and friendly. Um, I find the community basis of sort of the swim run movement is like, you know, super inspiring. I think, I think triathlon loses a lot of that because there's so much of the bike, right? Maybe you've just got your head down on the bike for so long, not talking to anyone. Like you just become, you know, a bit of a loner, but it's complete. The swim run environment is completely different to triathlon. So I'm looking forward to that opening up. I've signed up to some 70.3 Ironman events. So look, I hope that starts to open up slowly and they get systems in place, which allow us to actually compete outside of, you know, Zwift and virtual Ironman races and all that sort of stuff, which is, I don't know how sustainable that's going to be. Um, professionally, I run a public company in Australia. Uh, we make cardiovascular health devices for me measuring central um, aortic pressure, which is kind of a big deal at the moment, given that um, about 80% of the deaths in the United States um, have hypertension as their comorbidity. So um, it's a great, uh, we have a great platform to um, uh, sort of add into that environment, which we're sort of actively building and sort of developing more and more. Uh, so yeah, we're listed on the public um, uh, exchange in Australia, the Australian Stock Exchange. So that's really the focus of my business um, activity. Pretty much everything that I have been doing over the last you know, four or five years. You know, I had a TV show, as you know, uh, called The Venture Capitalists. Uh, we were kind of like the shark tank for the outdoors. Um, so, you know, that was a lot of fun. Um, I wrote my book, which was awesome. Um, and I've had a lot of venture investments, but pretty much everything that I've been doing is sort of like put on the, put on the side as I focus on the public company, which is kind of a, um, you know, a big deal. We think it's going to be a significant sort of multi hundred million dollar opportunity. Um, so that's kind of 80% of my day. Um, you know, my family's in Australia. My girls are in, you know, Sydney. They went back there to go to UNSW and they're now, um, sort of based there because they, you know, they grew up here since they were six. They went back to Australia. They basically decided they loved it too much. They loved the boys. They loved the music. They loved, you know, being able to drink at 20. Um, so, yeah, so they decided not to come back. So, you know, I want to get back there because I've been spending probably, you know, every quarter I have been back in Australia for, um, you know, either fundraising or, you know, other sort of corporate responsibilities. So I'm looking forward to getting back into that. Um, but, you know, my challenges, I think from a health perspective, uh, Brenton, I think my biggest challenge is sleep. And, you know, it's funny, I was watching a triathlon video last night with triathlon Taron, who I think you've interviewed and, you know, helped in the past with this, uh, with a swim stroke. And, uh, he was interviewing the top triathletes around their sleep regimes and they're all going, you know, I get like, you know, nine or 10 hours, I get like eight or nine. I'm just like shaking my head. I say like, how do you do that? It's like, <laughs> it's a great sound bite, but it's just like in my world, it's just impossible. Um, I've written articles on sleep therapy. I've, you know, blogged about it. I've been on Huffington Post. Or, but, you know, it's one thing to talk about it and know what to do, but, you know, executing against it. So, you know, when you look at from a health perspective in terms of, you know, natural testosterone production, um, uh, you know, obviously recovery, um, you know, it's the number one free recovery tool, you know, mm -hmm. is sleep. Um, you know, across the board, sleep is just such a key component. So I'm lucky to get like six hours a night, you know, consistently which is just not enough. Um, so, you know, we focus a lot on our sleep. You know, my wife and I wake up in the morning. First thing we say is like, how many hours did you get? How many times did you get up? You know, it's like, it's a big deal. Um, you know, we avoid drugs. We use, you know, as much natural therapies as we can around it in terms of, you know, processes before we get to sleep. But sleep's a big part of it. Um, staying injury-free um, is the most important thing for me outside of sleep, right? Because I put myself into the game and it takes a long time to get back in and get to the level where, you know, I'm at, you know, um, you know, age group competitiveness, but then I'm always like operating on the threshold of sort of injuring myself again. And my consistent problem has been, you know, my lumbar spine and I'm going in next week to get some epidural cortisol, you know, injections in my back again. Um, I've got access to, you know, a lot of good people who can help me, but it's just, it's just the thing that, you know, I've got, you know, I've just got to accept it. So managing that and, you know, pushing myself to the limit as much as I can without hurting myself and competing as, you know, best I can. Um, because, you know, I want to keep thriving. I want to, you know, keep, you know, uh, competitive in my age group. And, um, you know, I'm in a fairly competitive age group. You may think 57 may not be that competitive, but, you know, that's sort of like, if you're sort of 55, 56, and where sort of the bottom threshold is, that's a competitive age group. Um, 
So, you know, I want to sort of push myself into that. And I've enjoyed, as you said, getting back into triathlon. I hadn't done it for 25 years. So I've just started doing that the last sort of six months. Um, so, yeah, that's um, – and just, you know, just continuing to, you know, practicing what I preach as best I can. Mm. It's, uh, it sounds like you've got a, a lot on your plate, but I, you know, it, it's, those, it's having those things to do where you can – progress you can you can work towards something that's really where that enjoyment in in life comes from i mean for me i i love just being able to try to continually improve my swimming or surfing or running whatever it might be and uh and also just uh and growing the business work growing effortless swimming and, and seeing how much better we can can make things and it's uh that's really what where i get a lot of enjoyment from so um craig thanks very much for being on the podcast and for doing it a second time through <laughs> and uh, and when you do get to uh, to Melbourne or back to Australia, be good to catch up. Yeah, well, look, uh, you talk about my you know life goals for the next twelve months. You know, I, I would rather meet you in Noosa for the uh, for the Noosa swim <laughs> camp, and um, you know, do some laps out to you know Granite or Tea Tree. That would be, you know, I think that's something I want to you know go to bed thinking about tonight. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. I mean, thinking about that now, it's uh, it's it was already a good thing to do, but now when uh, when I can't travel to uh, to Queensland to do anything at the moment. It seems even more uh, more enjoyable. So yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Thanks again, Craig.